three, two, one, and we're back. Okay, so I'm by myself today in this podcast again, um, and I'm especially excited about this podcast because um, it's I it's on a plug that I have done incredibly, incredibly well on this year. It's the plug that I've done the best on this year, um, and it's one that I got way, like, it's a I, what I think is the, one of the most underrated plugs out there. Um, and the reason I'm saying this is because uh, as far as, like, the lures go, um, this one, you wouldn't, like, you wouldn't expect this to be the the plug that you would throw as much as you should. Like, I feel like it's a very underrated lure because a lot of people, they, they throw, you know, super strike darters, they throw needlefish, um, but not a lot of people throw metal lip swimmers and especially deep diving metal lips. And that's where I think I was kind of caught off guard at how well this plug does. I'm even going to go out on a limb and say they're better than a darter, uh, because they can cover more of a water column. Um, and I, before I go out and say they, these are the greatest plugs of all time, cause I feel like I'm going to not do justice by saying I've never fished a better plug than this. Um, I want to just go over a little bit about why, um, why this, why this plug is done so well for me this season and also, uh, why it's been so bad. Like, what are the, what's the worst part about this plug? I guess is where we're going to start with. What is the worst part about this plug? Now, I can think of one main, main, major thing is, um, I've had, I have a very hard time casting, um, the metal up swimmers very far. That's one big complaint. Um, and then that's pretty much it. Like, as far as it goes on the complaints. I mean, this plug does almost everything you want out of a lure uh and it's pretty shocking because when i first picked up this lure i was like okay how do i work this so that i can catch fish and because i never really use metal lips especially deep diving metal lips at the beginning of this season and i was like i really want to get more into metal lip swimmers and i want to do that and then i I was doing it with danny plugs um and i was having a lot of success in early spring i mean a lot of guys were catching small squealy bass and I was like hmm I wonder if I could throw this Danny plug and if I'll get a little bit bigger ones and when everybody else was catching you know 15 inch bass I was catching 28 30 you know 35 inch fish in early May like I think I caught my first keeper maybe in the first week of May on a metal lip swimmer and then I caught a 35 incher a few days after that Um, I mean, it was one of those things that like, yeah, 35 inch basses can be like the first fish there, but you know, I was definitely catching the larger bass on a metal lip. But as I kept fishing in the season, I was like, it's getting a little wavy one day. It was wavy out. And I was like, how can I, um, how can I use this plug and get, you know, use this plug when it's wavy and windy out. And I, I got turned on to the deep diving crankbaits, um, deep diving crankbaits, deep diving metal lips. Um, and I was like, okay, um, I'm gonna, I, I think that this is going to be the, the best thing. Cause I, the first one I picked up, it wasn't a Pumba. It was another company. I don't even know the name of. And, um, the problem with that is that it just, you couldn't reel it very fast. And I was like, you know, I'm fishing in a spot and it's getting down into the rocks where I want it to be, but it's not really, you know, I can't really, I don't feel like it's realistic enough and it has good enough profile that the bass are going to hit it. Now, um, unfortunately I ended up getting that hit on a rock or something and I think the lip bent, but regardless, a few months later I started, um, you know, working with Pumbo plugs and I, I started, I picked up this plug and he said, this is one of my favorite plugs. Um, and I was like, okay, I, I knew obviously from the spring that, you know, I've thrown some metal lips and I was doing well on the metal lips. And I was like, okay, it's an interesting plug. I want to test it out. And I started by just reeling it straight in right through the water, just straight retrieve just to see what it did. And it had this little, you know, wobble side to side, like wobbling action. Like it was like swimming, but it wasn't super dramatic, but it was a nice subtle movement. And I'm like, okay, you know, this has kind of like, I would say like a SP minnow 
motion to it, with that very tight wobble side to side. Uh, I was like, okay, this is an interesting plug. Um, and actually, the, I'll show you. I have here the first uh, was one that he gave me. You can see that this thing got really, really beat up to the point that I actually have had I had a bass break the tail hook off of this plug. I mean, that just shows you how how intense, you know, and how much pressure I'm putting on these fish. These are, you know, 4X strong VMCs. Actually, I think I put a, a, an 8X strong on, on this because I knew back when I was catching a lot of big fish on this plug early in the season, um, or mid, midway through the season, I guess, um, they were breaking hooks, like easily breaking hooks. And I needed to put on some heavier hardware. Uh, but you can, I threw this plug to death. I mean, I caught, I've caught over 300 fish on this plug alone. And a lot of those fish have been easily, I'd say the vast majority were at least 30 inches or more. Um, I mean, I had, I've had the biggest bass I caught on it was 48, one of the 48 inches I got this season was on, um, this exact plug right here. Um, and I caught countless 25 pound, 20 pound bass on it. But I guess we'll get into when I first started using this because this is a great story and I really, uh, well, I really enjoyed this story. Um, so what happened was I was fishing and it was, uh, it was good, like it had good conditions. Um, I think it was, I think it was like maybe five days before a new moon. It was like kind of coming up on that new moon mark. So I was like, okay, the bass should start getting really riled up at night and I sh had a good wind and I was like, I'm going to go to this spot and it's been producing, you know, a couple of like, I mean, it, w it was pretty good in the spring and then it was like not good for a couple of months and then it started to heat back up a bit uh, later in the summer um, and then it, kind of, it died back off again. But for this little bit, I was getting some good fish in the spot um, and so what happened was, is I had some, I had the bass start you know, you know, I was catching fish in that area that were like 28 inches pretty consistently. Um, and so I was like at night, so I was like, okay, I'm going to go there. Uh, it's like mid or late July at this point. Um, and I tied on this plug. I, um, I was casting in this area and boom, I was hooking up. I was like, huh, interesting. Uh, and then all of a sudden the bite stopped again. I'm like, what's going on? And so then I started to experiment with, and this was during the day, by the way, and I started right, like, I guess it was like in the evening before it got dark, because I also fished into the dark. Um, I started experimenting with giving these big, long rips with the rod. I mean, I was reeling up a lot of slack and probably ripping my rod maybe a meter through the, you know, through the water, like ripping the line probably a meter in and then pausing it. And it was having this like big, like wide, like kicking, swimming motion under the water. I mean, it was a big wide S shape and then it would jut up at the end. And then it would, and then, cause it's a floating plug, it would slowly start wobbling up. And as soon as I started doing that, I started absolutely destroying the fish. Uh, it was probably, I probably started fishing at like maybe six o'clock, the bite died off and like, 30 minutes start picking back up once the sun went down or it's going down. So it was probably like sunset at probably seven ish uh, or like it was probably seven, like 30 sunset or something, but I was getting them. Uh, I was getting good. Like I was getting the bite was really good between like seven and like eight. You know, I had, I was catching bass every cast. They weren't big. They're pretty, they're actually pretty small fish. I mean, I was getting them probably between 15 and 25 inches and a few 28 30 inches mixed in I was doing well and I was like okay um it's this is this is working well and uh the cool part about where I was fishing was it was like the there it was kind of like a pebbly beach area and then there was like a um a few boulders really far out and then a few and it was like a boulder field but then there's a few big boulders uh and there's on a certain, uh, on an outgoing tide on the left side of this boulder, it was not very big, it was probably maybe a 15 foot boulder. Um, you can walk up to it on the left side, there was some current that would kind of push uh, like across it. 
and um, and then I, it was kind of like built up because there's a bunch of rocks kind of building up to this few boulders out of the water. It was probably 15 foot like little area, uh, but it was probably like chest deep out to there. So I was like, okay, the tide's going out. I'm gonna and the sun's going down. I want to get out on that boulder before the tide swings because it was right. It was like just about to go slack, and I was like, I need to get out there now so that I can fish this area. Um, and it was it and I because the bite stopped where I was fishing because it was slack tide and the bass were pushed off, the schoolies pushed off and they weren't feeding very heavily. And so I walked out to that rock and I I watched as, um, as you know, I just, I watched the waves crashing as I was coming over to it. And then I slowly grabbed on the seaweed and pulled myself up, trying not to get knocked off by a wave. And then I got up finally. Um, this is also in like mid or late July, so it was the water was warm at this time, so it wasn't like I was um, it wasn't like it was super cold. So I I was fine. I wasn't in like waders or I wasn't in a wetsuit or anything. I could just have like a bathing suit on, and swim out, and climb up onto this boulder field uh, or like group of boulders. Um, and so I was up on that group of boulders and. I cast off and I kid you not, I take two long rips of the rod. At this point, it's like just got dark out. Um, I take two long rips of the rod and then the plug stops. I'm like, oh, I got stuck in a rock. And all of a sudden the fish takes off. I mean, it wasn't huge, but it pulled good. I mean, it, it pulled, you know, uh, it did one solid run. So I was like, okay, this is not like 30 pounds, but it's going to be at least a 20 pound bass. And it took one good run and I started to work it in, doing a couple of good short head shake slash like just pulling really hard quickly. And then I got this fish up and I was like, whoa, this is a, you know, 22, 23 pound bass. Uh, and I was like, wow, okay. That was first cast in the spot where I've been doing bad, not bad, but I wasn't doing good all season. I had one bass there early like June um, that, uh, my brother got the one that's been doing the podcast with me. He caught a 43 there on a top and top water, like early in the spring, way when like really early for us, at least for big fish. I mean, I guess there's a few keepers, uh, like big, like 40 inch bass around, but to my knowledge, that was one of the first 40 inch bass that was caught in our area, literally of the whole season. It was a 44 inch bass, I think. And, um, yeah, we, that was awesome, but it was the same area. It was probably 30 feet to the left of it though. So it was the same area. I mean, that area is good because it has some boulders and um, it, it, it like, it was a good, it's a good solid place and I knew it had good structure and good current and definitely had places that, that would hold some nice fish. So I knew that it was in the right area. So anyway, I, I cast out there and I, I got that fish and I got him up and I'm like, wow, okay. I fished this spot all for the past two weeks um, and because I was hoping that it was going to get lit up again. And I actually had to abandon that spot towards the end of the season, but um, I was hoping it was going to get lit up again. And, um, but it was, it just went, it, but it did for that point. It just, boom, I was catching, I caught a 25 pound bass out of nowhere. I was like, wow, okay, this, this plug's legit. I mean, I mean, I was fishing that area. I was using... Like I used darters. I was using literally super strike darters in that area earlier in like two weeks before, a uh, week before um, I used it that the new moon and the full moon and was getting nothing in that spot. Um, and then I used, and so that's what was going down and I was not catching a lot of fish there and then all of a sudden a 25 pound bass. I mean, you can imagine how I was pretty shocked having caught a handful of bass that were in that low you know, 28 to 30 inch size, even some really small 15 inch bass. And then all of a sudden pulling a 25 pounder or a little less than 25 pound bass. I was like, wow, that's crazy. Um, and then I proceeded within the next, I don't know, maybe six casts. I got like three fish over 20 pounds, a few that were low 15 pounders. So these were all like mid to high 30 inch bass. Uh, and I think the biggest one of the night was like a probably like a 28 pound bass and it was like you know maybe 40 inches it was it was a quality quality fish and I would start to really get on these quality bites and I was super excited with this plug in particular 
and I switched it up. So that night, I so you can imagine I'm catching almost every single cast. I'm pulling a bass that's 35 inches. I threw on a super strike darter, casted six casts in that area, you know, just to test something out. And I don't know, it's a weird number, six, but yeah, it was like six casts in that area and um, not a hit. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? So I tied this plug back on, first cast cut 25 pounder. And I'm like, okay, this is the money. So then I was like, okay, what else can I throw to just test this out? And I was like, maybe they're down deeper. Um, so what did I, I tied on a, um, well, I threw a bucktail for a bit. And I caught like two schoolies on a bucktail or really not big, like 25 inches. And I was like, okay, uh, that was just like a test to see if they're down low, which I thought they were. And they seem to be, and I'm fishing probably maybe eight feet of water. And this probably goes down four feet and maybe, maybe a little more, actually probably definitely more, probably down eight feet in the water if you rip it. And then um, super strike darter probably goes down four or five feet. Um, and then of course I could get the bucktail down about, you know, all the way I needed right down to the rocks. Um, and so I actually ended up bending the eye of the hook up to get it to dive deeper. So I was actually hitting the boulders as I was moving it across. And that's when I ended up catching my biggest fish in the night. Um, and it was funny because like when it really started picking up and I started catching a bunch of 25 pounders, was just as the tide turned to come back in, the bass were really feeding heavily at that point. Um, and they were hitting on only this. And it was funny because I remember later that night I was fishing the same boulder and I was like, I'm not leaving this spot. I know I'm going to have to swim back, but I'm not leaving this spot because I was catching them like crazy. And I remember it was, um, it was, uh, it was not that bright out, but I kept hearing these something going on in the water. And I was like, hey, what is going on? And I clicked my headlamp on and there was probably 400 yards of mackerel just from like all over just like it was insane the amount of mackerel that was there and i wasn't seeing bass they weren't blitzing on the mackerel they weren't blown up on it the mackerel were uh i think it's called like winding where they're like kind of jumping on the surface with their mouths out of the water so they were trying to escape fish there were bass there um and i was pretty shocked to see that amount of mackerel having not seen mackerel like that all year um so anyway i i was that I thought okay maybe that's why I was catching fish so I was in the same boat I was like okay there's bait in the water that means I'm going to be catch uh, that's probably why I'm going to be catching fish although there's a lot of bait in the water and I was still catching fish where in other scenarios I hadn't been um so then for the for the next six nights in a row I started really killing it out of there and there's no there's no bait in that area at that for the next the, the rest of those nights i mean that was the only night that i saw mackerel you know on the surface and i wasn't fishing mackerel color plugs i was fishing a bunker color plug but when it was within the three days of the new moon i switched over to a black and purple um this one exact i don't know if it was this exact plug but like a plug like this and um i was getting a lot of 20 pound bass and um this was actually I, I don't think it was this plug actually, but a plug like this, this black and purple. No, it wasn't a black and purple. Um, I'm pretty sure it was a bunker. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a bunker. Uh, I caught a um, 48 pounder, 48 pounder. I got a 48 incher on this bunker um, uh, uh, swimmer um, from the chat swimmer from Pumba. Pumba plugs and it was it was funny because that that whole that spot was not producing fish for me um you know on either side of this bite this was one moon phase within multiple that I fished after that and didn't get a single fish over maybe 15 pounds in that area I mean maybe I got one that was like close to 15 pounds another night but this was the one night and it produced one of the biggest bass of my season uh, it was one of the 40 pound bass. It was probably, you know, 43, I think that one was on this. Um, and it was a 48 inch bass all day. I think I measured it too. I, I weighed it on the boga and I measured it out. It was 48 inches and 30, or not 30, um, 40 pounds. Um, and so I was really starting to catch a lot of really big fish on this plug and not on any other plug. Now, you might think, okay, you can go throw a super strike in that area and you're catching fish. No, it was such a specific bite. It was shocking because 
I knew people I would fish in that same area. They would be throwing live eels. They would be throwing um, all, like super strike darters, needlefish. They could not get a touch, you know, in that spot. This the swimmer, for some reason, was able to get down, produce that that shaking, that shimming uh, that the the fish wanted, and it caught fish. Um, and that's that's good because. I think that's what really actually put me on the map as far as striped bass hunt Instagram was those fish that I pulled from that from that um, that plug really were kind of the first few really big ones in my season. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just drinking a little bit of coffee. Um, anyway, so that was really cool. And I want to get more into the technical side of why. Why was this plug... Out of all the plugs that I was fishing, why was that plug the plug that actually made me start catching so many big fish? Um, and I think it's I think it was a very it was a very interesting um, it was a very interesting uh, re- like year as far as bait goes because we had a lot of we had a lot of adult bunker around to the point that I was in the harbor. Walk, or I was walking by the harbor one day with my family and we were I look in the harbor and you, I was watching probably they were probably 50 pound bass I mean they're enormous fish fully blitzing and pushing uh, adult bunker around in the harbor like incredibly enormous fish I didn't have a rod on me at that time so I went back to my house got a rod and was snagging the bunker and trying to catch fish on them unfortunately I didn't end up getting a bass on it because there's so many so much bait in the water that the bass weren't i mean even though i was just letting him live line around i it never got eaten and then the bite died but it was crazy because it was in the inner inner harbor like it was in the inner harbor it wasn't like um we were like in the mouth of the harbor or anything i mean the bunker got pushed in i mean that just shows you how many adult bunker there were and i heard stories of people you know snagging you know full 12 inch bunker from shore and just pitching them back out into the water and having 30 pound bass eating them right at their feet all summer long. You know, I heard that that was happening down Maine, uh, like from pretty much where we were down. There's just so much bunker this year. Um, or up, I guess. Yeah, it would be up. Um, so pretty much from where we were up, um, we were getting so much, um, so much bunker around. And so, especially in the area that I am, we, we got it was it was insane and i literally remember kayaking off off of a few spots that i fished and i there's so much bunker in the water that you could drop a lot like a snagging hook down off of a kayak and do and you'd feel them hitting into your line even though you wouldn't see them anywhere every once in a while you'd see one jump there's i mean so many bunker down there you just snag them and it was crazy the amount of bait that was around um but what was happening is those really, really big fish were out in during the day. They're out deep in the water feeding on the adult bunker. And then at night, they would start, they'd come in and start setting up on the structure at night, coming in close into the shallow water and setting up on the structure and getting ready for to feed at night. And um, when us shore, angl- shore anglers are going to be able to, you know, end up getting in contact with a lot of these big fish, uh, so it was a very unique year, and that's one of the big reasons and I've talked about this a couple of times in the podcast about why I did so well um, the past season. But um, as far as like it being like one of the like craziest nights I had on this, I was actually with Joe from Pumba Plugs, um, and we we wrecked it on this plug. It was probably late August. I'm going to tell one more story and then I'll get into more technical stuff, but it was late August. And, um, we, this was after I caught in this, there was another spot that lit up later that year. And, um, that I actually just recently discovered and started lighting up like crazy. I was catching so many 30, 40 pounders there on eels and stuff. It was insane. And I bring him here and I'm telling him to bring the biggest plugs he has. And this was actually, when he made the jointed swimmer, I'll just grab that right now. Um, he made this plug. This is uh, when he actually first 
produce this plug and wanted to test it out and he was like is this going to be too big because he made it because he was going to go swing by the cape cod canal and he was going to fish down the cape a lot but um he was he asked me he's like is this plug going to be too big and i was like no this is perfect because if you think about it this is the same shape and length of a bunker adult bunker and the bass were feeding on these huge huge baits um and uh you know but as well as you know this is looking looking pretty good and looking a lot like a nice big bunker as well so both ways were working well and i told him i was like Hat, you should be throwing the swimmer and he's uh he was like i want to try this one out first i mean i've told the story a handful of times because it was just such an epic night i mean we had i won't go into i guess i won't really go into it that much because he he had i don't even know probably 15 fish over 20 pounds uh and he lost that actually he lost the first this the big swimmer here or the big uh yeah i guess it's like a I don't know. Anyway, the big jointed swimmer, and he uh, he lost that on a fish that had to be close to forty pounds. I mean, he just took him into the rocks. It was huge, um, and I was fishing the swimmers, and I he had like four or five swimmers. He brought there fresh, and we were catching him every cast. I mean, I probably caught fifteen over twenty five pounds. He caught easily fifteen over twenty five pounds, and we were just wrecking it in this one area. Um, but, uh, the reason why I wanted to say that is because, um, the cool thing is this is the, what I would say the perfect structure for fishing a deep diving metal lip swimmer is, um, it is a boulder field, a shallow boulder field. Um, that's about, I don't know, maybe I would say at shallowest I'd be fishing five feet and at deepest I'd be fishing maybe 15. Um, but, um, but the sweet spot is about eight to 10. Um, and I'm fishing the spot that it literally drops probably every meter you go, it drops two feet and you, and it's perfect. Cause at the end of your, you cast this thing as far as you can. I could probably get this 50 yards on a, with a big rod. I can get this about 50 yards out there and I dig it in. And if, I tweak the the eye of the hook up. It's gonna dive a little bit deeper. So what I did is I, I tweaked it so it would dive deeper and I could reel it down. And the cool thing is I'm doing these either little rod lifts, so I'm getting the plug to flutter up really quickly, or I'm doing these jerks to the side when the when the plug gets in closer to me. Um, and so I cast it out there, and my objective is to have that plug as close to the boulder. So say if you're watching the video podcast, say my hand is a boulder. And my plug, I want the plug to get down and hit the boulder and then flutter up above the boulder. Because So when you're reeling it in, you jerk it down. It does these huge like side-to-side swim motions as it goes down and it bounces off a boulder. And then it flutters just up above that boulder. And then you do a rip or two across to another boulder. And what the bass are doing is sitting right behind those boulders. And they're waiting for this bait to come and hit. Pretty much you're hitting the plug right in front of its nose and the bass is just not gonna like it's not gonna give up a free meal like that if you're putting like a, a nice juicy bunker right in front of the nose of a fish it's gonna hit it it's just i mean especially with that rip it has that little reaction strike and you're pausing it for only a moment i mean the bass are gonna whack it i mean no questions if you get this in front of a nice like a good fish and you're bouncing it across the rocks and they see that they'll either come from far away they'll come running in or swimming in rather and then they'll smash this or if you can get it if they're being finicky it also getting it right in front of their nose they'll whack it too so um i so the objective is to get that in right next to the rock bounce off the rock jerk it up a little bit let it swim through a little bit jerk it back down pause it let it flutter and what that's doing is just making that nice motion getting that fish really riled up when this plug's getting in there into its strike zone and uh that's something that is really hard to do with a super strike darter or really any darter for that matter so really hard to do with a darter really hard to do with any like a bottleneck swimmer uh even like a popper i mean some of those like poppers that you can swim um even a bucktail uh you get snagged on the rocks a lot doesn't have this nose that stops it from getting snagged up on a rock it just goes right into it and gets caught a lot of the times 
So a lot of the time, so what happens with a bucktail is it has that single hook. If you get into a rock, sometimes it'll flip sideways and you'll hook it onto a rock. With this, you get into a rock, it hits it, and then it just flutters up, and then it goes along. No problem. You don't lose it in the rocks. But the other thing is, even if it's shallow, you know, you're not, you're not really, you don't want to mess around with it too much. If it's shallow, just kind of leave it at its, like, I guess, factory build. Um, so that, cause it's dropping probably five to eight feet, I'd guess. And with the rips and even just reeling it straight, I'll get into that in a second. Cause sometimes they don't really want it all crazy. Like, but there was a few nights where they really wanted those big wide swings and I would cast it out and I'd do these, I'd do these big swings and I'd feel it bounce off a rock and literally as soon as it bounced off that rock, it would get whacked. And that's like three cranks of the reel. I mean, the bass where if they're there and they're hungry, they're going to whack that thing because it looks so much like a bunker. I mean, we were matching the hatch with the color, the shape, the size. I mean, everything was perfect. Uh, so I guess we took a lot of the guessing out of it when we got to that point, but we were really doing well on it, getting these some incredible fish. So where you want to fish it, I'm talking a boulder field is my personal favorite. I mean, you can fish it on Sandy Beach, you can fish it in current, you can fish it in the canal, you can do whatever you want. But like, if I'm going to say you want to get a really big fish really easily on this, I know this is going to weed out a lot of people that are probably listening that fish a lot more Sandy Beaches. But if you can fish on a, like if you're fishing, if you can find a boulder field, a jetty or something, and you can cast it off, you can rip it down right next to the boulders where these bass are, you know, either hiding from the current or just searching for bait right in, in amongst the boulders uh the bass will i mean you have that eight feet of water you have the boulders that's gonna be holding crabs you know uh, lobsters i mean the place the, my favorite place to fish at low tide you'll be wading out and you'll be almost stepping on lobsters there's that many lobsters in the water there i mean they're jutting out from all over under your feet i mean it's insane Especially at night, you can see them, their eyes like glow back at you when you're walking with your headlamp. Um, and so they're they're right in there, you know, rooting around, looking for a bunker that get either pushed into the rocks from the wind and the waves or other small bait fish. And um, the, the, I mean, it's been, it was, so that's why you want to fish in those shallower boulder fields because that's where the bass are going to be coming in and feeding. Uh, a little bit of current is always good for these plugs as well. I mean, they can definitely survive some current you can throw them in the strongest current at the canal and they'll dig right down in there uh that's why i'm saying like if you're using a deep diving uh like a deep diving metal lip in general a lot of them are, you can't reel very fast or else they just don't work some uh they dive too deep or i mean this is per i think it's like a happy medium it dives deep enough you can give it a good jerk or two to get it to really you know you know swim very erratically through the water so that's that. So that's really my go-to for that. But if I'm fishing on like a sandy beach and they're there, you know, there's bunker around and they're keyed in on bunker. If I cast that thing out and I know it's pretty, it's not super deep. It's like maybe five or six feet deep, and then it gets shallower as you bring it in. I'm reeling it at maybe a steady retrieve, and and this plug is just slowly wobbling and kind of swimming back and forth as it goes. A little wobble and shimmy. I mean, it's doing this little like swimming motion like this through the water um, and the tail's kicking perfectly. It looks so much like a fish in the water and I mean, it's just kicking along and what's going to happen is those bass that are, you know, the bunker are swimming along the beach because they're trying to get, get away from these fish. They're right in close to shore and they're swimming along it. So another thing that you can try to do is cast kind of diagonally down the beach when you know there's bunker kind of running the beach, especially during... Um, during like the fall run when there's big bluefish or bass feeding on these bunker. Uh, you go to a beach at night and you know there's been bass feeding on an adult bunker. Throw this thing in there and cast it kind of parallel to the beach and you reel it nice and slow and it kind of wobbles. It doesn't dive too deep and it's just wobbling along there. I mean, oh my gosh, this thing slams it. Um, so that's when I'm, when I'm, I wouldn't unless, and the other thing is when you're fishing a boulder field, try mixing it up, you know, when you're fishing with these metal lips. Try bending the eye up to make it deep, go dive deeper. Try bending it down to make it a little bit shallower. Um, I've even bent it down to the point that it's just on the, like just below the surface, even making a little V wake 
across the surface of the water. I did that in an estuary, or I guess it was more of a river mouth earlier this year. I mean, that's what you want, and especially in the river mouths when the big bait is getting pushed around, kind of like that uh, harbor that I was in. The bass are definitely in, like, waiting for that bait to get injured and be up on the surface. That's when they know that that's easy to hit them. And the reason why they, they want to go for the fish on the surface is, if you think about it, when the when a bass is chasing a piece of bait, or chasing like a bait fish, uh, it can, the bait fish can go almost any direction when it's in the water. When it's up at the surface of the water, it can't go any more up. So it can only go side to side because fish can't swim backwards. So it can only go side to side. And so it, they just go right for the head. And if it goes either direction, it's it's too late because the bass is going to be able to hit it. Um, so that's why they like it when it's on the surface. That's why top water works so great because they know that the fish can't get away from them. Um, so when I'm fishing these, you know, I you and I'm not I'm not going to be ripping them when I have it right up on the surface. I'm reeling it nice and slow and letting it just a little bit of a wobble, even just almost so it's not really moving that much and it's really just kind of wobbling a little bit and just little like little swimming action side to side on the surface like that and the bass just they pipe it right on the surface um it's it's truly it's one of my favorite ways to fish uh is like a metal up on the surface i mean it's so awesome to see a bass hit it but the cool thing is with this is if you're fishing in the rocks and you're not getting them down low you can experiment with bending the lips you can cover the entire water column i'm talking from the surface to as deep as you can pretty much go i mean you can cover everything and you'll know i mean the bass are either not keyed in on your bait or they're not feeding heavily at that time or they're not even there um so you'll so that's a good way to you know cover a lot of water and it's definitely a good way to to catch some really really nice fish um and i think it's a very underrated plug because i don't i feel like people are not don't feel as confident with it because they can't cast it as far or they don't want to get, snag it on the rocks, especially a lot of metal ups are super expensive. As far as metal ups go, the Pumba um, shad sticks are, are pretty affordable as far as a metal up goes. And it's definitely one of my all time favorite big bass plugs. I mean, I've had so many like 20 to 40 pound bass on this plug alone this season. I mean, uh, you go to Pumba Plugs Instagram, and he'll be tilt saying like he doesn't know any other plug that's doing what this thing did this year as far as numbers of big bass. I mean, it's truly extraordinary for like a. It just, I mean, it's done absolute wonders, and it's caught fish where people fish a lot and are with a lot of really well known plugs and are doing not as well as I am catching maybe one fifteen twenty pounder a night and that's like on a good day where I'm on a bad day catching multiple 20, 15 pound bass, you know, on this plug in spots. So that's why this, uh, in, it doesn't need to be a Pumba. I mean, any deep diving metal lip that you can work and get a, and work it a little bit, you can work it slow and fast all at the same time. Cause a lot of them you can work slow, but can you actually speed up that plug and keep the action or increase the action on the plug? And that's where I think this comes in a little bit differently. Um, and I've done very, very well in spots where it's been very slow. And then all of a sudden I'm throwing this plug and I, cause it's been very slow and then I'm pulling really big bass out of it as well as spots that have been doing that have been on fire all season. I'm coming in with those plugs and I'm catching the biggest bass out of there. I mean, I like, I had one night I had a sack of eels like ready to throw into this water where I knew I was catching big fish on eels. And I was like, why am I going to use my eels if I can get equal not a bigger fish on these bass that are keyed in on a bunker so i was throwing these plugs in there and i was catching huge 35 pound bass and these fish were you know they're inhaling this plug um and the sad part is a lot of the times where i caught I had my nights where i was catching multiple 30s um i wasn't i was i had to like swim and wade out to a boulders so i wasn't able to get some photos of them but i had some really really nice bass on those plugs there and it's been, it was a, a really nice uh, uh, season for this plug in general. It really kind of catered to this plug. All right, so right now I want to just answer some comments uh, that I had about Metal Lips because uh, I had some good comments about them on Instagram. So if you don't follow me on Instagram, I'm Stripe Bass Hunt on Instagram as well as please when I, I put up on my story, I um, like quite, like uh, ask me a question about either 
for the podcast or about something so that I can do a podcast on it. Um, and that is uh, awesome. And as well as anytime DM me about any questions you have and I'll either answer it there or if you want me to talk about it in the podcast so I can go even more in depth on it, I will definitely, definitely uh, feature it in the next podcast. Okay. So the first question I have is um, deep diving, midwater or top water? And I guess I went over this uh, a little bit because um, the, the the cool thing about these plugs is they do all of it. But if I'm talking about I want to catch the biggest bass out of a spot, and I mean the biggest bass out of a spot, I'm going to go for the deep diving, honestly. I mean, mid midwater's second best. I mean, and depending on your spot, you want to kind of go with that midwater. I would say when you first pick up a Pumba um, shad stick, uh, it's going to be a mid, mid like a midwater. And that is... I, Totally, I've gr taken them out of the package and I've thrown them and caught 35 pound bass in the midwater. So I'm either calling it maybe a midwater or like definitely, definitely I'm going deep diving because I've been doing so well. I did so well on the deep diving. And the only reason I'm not saying top water is because I'm, I'm kind of catering that more to a Danny plug, which is a whole other podcast for Danny plugs. And I've caught plenty of really nice fish on Danny plugs. As I said, in the spring, I did really, really well on Danny plugs. So it was only fitting to really get into uh, some deep diving ones in midwater to deep diving ones this season. Um, it was a lot of fun to, to try out new plugs because that's really what I think is, I mean, you can try to get to the next level by using different plugs, but as well as part of the exploration and, you know, bass fishing is to, to try out some really nice plugs and to try out new stuff because you never know what might be your new favorite plug. I feel like for me, it at least varies season to season what plug I'm going to be using. Um, I'm just going to pull up another question here. Sorry. Um, um, how often do you tune them? How many different styles um, do you carry? Um, okay. So um, I, I tune the plug. Um, again, I tune the plug depending on uh, if the night's been slow. So if I'm fishing and it's like, not been great, um, and um, I've been catching a few schoolies, but I'm not really getting the numbers of big fish I want. Whether I'm in the middle or on the bottom, I'm gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna bring up the plug from a deep diving to midwater, and sometimes that's the, the ticket. Or if it's a calmer night, I'm gonna try to bring it up to the surface. I'm gonna try to have that nice little V wake on the surface, and uh, you know, it's been well. I mean, clearly, if the bass want it, they'll they'll grab it. <laughs> excuse me um anyway a little sick <laughs> um but so uh yeah i'm gonna be throwing uh either i'm gonna go uh yeah i mean how often do i tune them i guess i tune them every uh i feel like i tune them at least once a trip because i what i try to do is i try to you know, vary my depths, even if I'm doing well at some, at a certain depth, sometimes I like to tweak it just to see if it's better. That's just me. And also you can experiment yourself. But the one thing is never tune the actual lip itself. Always tune the eye of the, the hook um, or the plug, like the eye of a hook, but like it's the eye of the plug where you tie your line through. That's what you want to bend up to make the plug go down and down to make the plug go up. Okay. Um, Next one, um, what is your favorite weight for metal lips? Um, I'm assuming he's just saying as far as the, how heavy they are. Um, these ones I, I think are between two and a half and three ounces. So that's like good. I would say I wouldn't go any heavier than that. I don't know, like as far as like, I don't think it really matters. It just depends on like what you are throwing for a rod. You can throw a small metal lip that's really small, like that big, or you can throw a giant, you know, Danny plug and they can be much heavier. Um, but honestly, if I'm going to be throwing a uh, metal lip, I'm going to be throwing, um, you know, between, I guess, two and five ounces it would probably be my, my, my uh, gauge as far as weight. And as far as length go, I think that, you can pretty much go like I like bigger ones between like I mean I think this is like a six seven inch plug and I mean and I'm gonna 
just go, I mean, I've I've thrown Dannys that are like huge, huge, like 20 inch plugs. Not really, but they're probably at least like a 15 inch plug that, you know, create a huge profile for a large piece of bait, you know? All right. So as far as weight goes, that's what I'm going to say for that. Um, last question. Uh, how exactly do you fish them fast or slow retrieve? Uh, so that's a really good question because, um, I, I, I like to fish them on a, I would say a medium retrieve. Um, and the thing is, uh, fishing a Danny plug, that's why, I mean, this question, you know, perfectly answers it. Cause there's a lot of people that are like kind of scared to use a Danny and the, or not Danny plug, scared to use a metal up, especially a deep diving metal up because, you know, you can lose them and, you know, they don't really know how to put action on them and they're afraid to, you know, do these big, like, movements, aggressive movements with them. But you can do a big aggressive movement with a plug like like this and it catches, I mean, it definitely catches those big basses' attention and makes them turn and hit. So I'm saying this is how I'd go. I would start off your night doing a straight cast and medium speed retrieve, enough that you I'd throw any plug that you get fresh out of the box and not going straight at night with. But if I get it fresh out of the box, I want to at least know what it does when I fish it anyway. I'm talking about reeling it slow, reeling at medium retrieve, reeling it really fast. I want to know what it looks like doing that. I want to know what it looks like when I jig it, when I pop it, whatever. Like I want to make sure I know exactly what the action is when I do anything with the plug. Now, um, when, when I'm fishing with a, like a, a swimmer like this, I'm gonna go off, I'm gonna start the night off with a slower retrieve, and I'm just gonna reel it nice and slow. If I'm not getting the hits I want, or if I'm not getting hits at all, I'm gonna speed it up to a medium retrieve, but with no jigs. Then I'm gonna do a medium retrieve, and then I'm gonna do a faster retrieve, and I'll probably not catch anything if the straight retrieve is not working. Then I'm gonna switch over to a, a very aggressive popping side to side zigzag motion, and then if that's not working, I'm gonna slow that down, so I'm doing like one lift of the rod, getting it just jolt up, or I'm let, waiting for it to hit a rock, letting it float up, and then give it a good jig um, with the rod. And you know, you can vary it. Everything varies, and I feel like every plug is a little bit different as far as like different deep diving baits. So I'm saying specifically for the shad stick, that's what I'm throwing for a deep diving bait because I think this is by far, there's no better deep diving swim swimmer than this. I mean, I just can't. I've fished a bunch of them this season. I fished probably 15 different like companies like deep diving on Gibbs and all of those companies. I don't think there's a better one than that right there. Um, cause I, I, it's just done so well for me. Um, and so the, and because I no reason why it's been doing so well for me is cause it doesn't fit that one application. It can cover a huge amount of your bases. And that's why it's so awesome because it can pretty much do what, you know, four different plugs do. It can be a top water, can be a medium diving or a deep diving lure. I mean, that's like, like crazy. And you can give it all sorts of action or you can give it just a little bit of action. So um, you can really cover a lot of your bases when you're talking about fishing a deep diving swim bait or swimmer. Um, so that's, that's why, I mean, it's, it's fun to experiment with new lures especially ones that are difficult and catch big fish. Um, and difficult and catch big fish are not like go hand in hand. This is an easy plug to work because you pretty much can't mess it up. You can cast it out there and reel it straight in. And I don't care if you're reeling as fast as you can or pretty slow, it's gonna do a little bit of something and it's gonna have that profile and it will have that color and it will be either if you want it in bunker, which is what I prefer because it has that very realistic uh, look to it. Um, and if there's bunker around, you could, literally rip the metal lip right off of that and reel it straight in with no action and it would still get eaten just because of the profile and the coloring. Um, but as far as plugs go, I'm fishing during when it's a new moon or when it's a full moon, I'm going to be fishing lighter plugs. Uh, I'll fish like white when it's a, a, well, I guess for a full moon, that's what I'm doing. When it's a new moon, I'm going to be fishing darker plugs and I'll be fishing a bunker imitation, imitating plug, you know, 24 seven. I'm talking when it's a new moon and when it's a full moon, I could throw this both times and I'm going to be equally as confident with it. Um, not saying that you can't throw a white plug when it's dark out, when it's like literally blackout. And then, cause what happens is 
I've fished new moons that are foggy and cloudy and there's not a single, like you, there's no light pollution at all. And I've thrown a white plug and it's been crazy. It's gone off on the white plug. And then I've had thrown a, like a dark colored plug on a full moon and I've had similar results. So I don't think it's a written rule. It's just kind of a rule of thumb that maybe it's a little bit better. But I think if there's nothing, especially like what I found out this year, one of the big takeaways from my year was throw a realistic, throw something that matches the bait that you're using. And that is something, or the bait that the fish are feeding on. And that's something that, um, that like, yeah, you kind of know about, okay, I want to match what the bass are naturally feeding on. But if you can match what the bass are naturally feeding on, I mean, it is extraordinary how much better you'll do. I mean, it is truly extraordinary. Um, but as far as like the deep diving swim swimmers go, uh, I feel like I covered it pretty good. Um, as far as rod and reel go, I like to throw a, um, my preference is a Vansall 200 uh, VSX 200 with a 50 pound super slick line on it um, tied to a um, 65 pound uh, fluorocarbon blue label cigar line um, and I like that my go-to rod is a uh, 10 foot 3 to 5 ounce uh, G uh, GSB rod is like my my kind of my go-to for like this type of a plug because it's not giant um, but it's also not small and I've used this type of a plug on rods that are 12 foot rods and can throw up to 10 ounces I've also used them on rods that are you know nine feet and throw two to three so it's just like it's really it varies as far as your where you're fishing and what you're comfortable with but i like like that's my pretty much my go-to setup when i'm fishing anywhere but uh yeah and i i'm probably gonna experiment and probably pick up a bigger reel because this is what i've been thinking myself um is when i i've been fishing a lot in boulder fields this year and i've been fishing heavy line but i feel like i'm lacking especially with the Vanstall 200. I mean, it has good heavy drag, but especially with a couple of those 40 pound bass, they gave me a run for my money uh, as far as not maybe not having enough drag pressure on them. Uh, even though, I mean, it's insane. I lock my drag all the way down. Um, but just for the a few spots that I fish, I, I'm thinking about maybe bumping it up to the 275 or something. So I guess you can tell me what you think. What's your, again, comment in either on YouTube or DM me what's your favorite... Um, rod and reel combo and um yeah because it's always fun to see what everybody else is fishing um and compare uh so thank you guys for watching this podcast or listening to it and um i'll see you next time